Well, good morning, family. Um, as people continue coming in, I am going to invite you who are already in to stand with us. Uh, it's always an amazing thing to be able to come together as a family and worship corporately, worship together to uh, not only worship through song, but also worship through conversation, through handshakes, through smiles, and then uh, certainly also hearing the word preached this morning. So let's, uh, let's sing together.
Well, good morning, Kettlebrook family. My name is Troy. I want to welcome you here to our gathering. Uh, if you are new or visiting with us this morning, we want to let you know who we are. We are a family of followers of Jesus, helping others follow Jesus. If you are new or visiting with us this morning, we would invite you to take a Connect card out of the seat back in front of you, fill that out and put that in the box on the back on, on the way out there. would love to connect with you, meet with you, have a chance to, to get to hear your story. This morning we are in the middle of a short series that we're calling Identity and Intimacy, where we've been taking a look at the four-chapter gospel, if you would, creation, fall, redemption, and restoration of God's design for our identity, our intimacy, our bodies, our sexuality. And so if you're here this morning and you're visiting with us, this is your first time here, you're, you maybe didn't know that, uh, we have, uh, we're going to be talking about some sensitive things. And so if you have children with you this morning, we do have children's programming available um, and over there and over here in our Rising Stars. Uh, just want to give you the kind of the heads up about what's going on today. Uh, to do that, we have a guest speaker, and I want to introduce him to you. I'm going to read some scripture and have him come up here. About a year ago, I had a, in a conversation with Mike Belanti, who is at Northbrook, and, and Mike had referenced a young man that he had come speak about sexuality um, named Lou. And so I went online, and I listened to that message, and after listening to that message, I, 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 called, I, I reached out to Lou. I said, hey, would you be available to come and speak in February of 2022? And about a year later, I, can, I think it's safe for me to say that Lou is a friend of mine. I've had a chance to process through a lot of things over the last year with him. Lou has an undergraduate degree in molecular biology and political science, was uh, accepted into med school, was going to become a doctor, and then felt a different call in his life. Hopefully I'm not stealing some of your thunder here. Uh, but felt a call to uh, help people process through some of the most challenging questions to the Christian faith had some theological studies at Oxford and went to the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics and has been spent the last seven years of his life speaking to college campuses, to conferences, and to churches, uh, basically trying to address some of the biggest objections to the Christian faith. And so I am really pumped to have Lou with us this morning. But he asked me before that we have him bring him up, we actually get into God's Word. And so to do that, I know you just sat down, but I'd love you to stand back up as we read the Word of God. We're going to read from um, a couple texts in Genesis. We're going to put, put them up here. You can follow along. Genesis 2, 15 through 17 says this, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then we have another text in this next slide. Genesis 3, 1 through 7, read like this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Gracious Father, this is your word, and it is true, and to be trusted. May you do what you promise, which is to not return it void. May you be, use it to convict us. May you use it to encourage us, to equip us, and empower us by your spirit. We pray this in Christ's name, and all God's people said, Amen. You're going to have a seat. Can we give a warm Kettlebrook family welcome to Lou Phillips? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think my mic's on. Can you guys hear me? Great. Awesome. Well, uh, as you said, my name is Lou. Um, I'm, I'm originally from Pittsburgh. Um, I know I probably don't look that, um, but I'm, I'm now from Atlanta, so the cold is actually too much for me. Um, and so this is a struggle of mine. But in growing up in Pittsburgh, um, I actually uh, grew up in a, a very blue-collar family. Uh, my dad was a, a pipe fitter and a steel worker, which kind of makes sense there. Um, and again, I know I said I don't look it. I, I assure you no steel worker wears these type of pants. But 
I'm trying to change the, the style there in Pittsburgh. And um, when I grew, as I grew up in Pittsburgh, uh, growing up in a blue-collar family, um, I often got to see my dad at work. Uh, he had a, a garage uh, right by our house, and I got to watch him uh, do his thing. And one time I remember he was welding a piece of pipe, and when he finished, he said, Louie, whatever you do, um, just don't touch this pipe. I know it doesn't look hot, but it's scolding, and if you touch it, it'll actually burn you severely. Now, I didn't really want to touch the pipe, but now I kind of wanted to. <laughs> I was like, why would you tell me those things? And so when he wasn't looking, um, I slowly lunged forward. Um, but if you know anything about welding, often with a welding rod, there's a little bit of debris. Uh, and as my foot slipped, I mean, as I reached out, my foot slipped and the edge of my face caught the steel. And um, I live with this reminder every day that I should have uh, listened to my father. I'm completely kidding. That's not what happened. This is a birthmark. Uh, what, actually, <laughs> what actually happened was I touched it really quick. I didn't get burnt, and I was really proud of myself. And he saw me, and he says, you couldn't help yourself, could you? I'm like, what do you, what do you care? Like, it didn't happen. Like, you told me I would get burned, and I didn't. I'm right. I tell you that story because something in me at a very young age said, no one tells me what to do. Like, if I don't agree with something, I should be able to do what I want. It's, it's my life. And like I said, I had no desire to touch this pipe. But the moment I was told I couldn't, something in me said, I want to challenge that. And whether we admit it or not, every single one of us struggle and battle with this every single day. Something in us says, no. I'm free to make my own choices. No one tells me what to do. And when push comes to shove, I do what I think is best. And if we're honest enough to admit it, we even do this with God sometimes. But see, what I find most fascinating about this is that every single person, every single generation, uh, doesn't really, I mean, with regards to this concept, every generation thinks, if, if people really knew the time frame I lived in, if people had the experience I had, saw the society I lived in, uh, or you know, had the parents I had or had to live through COVID, they too would understand why I challenge authority. They too would say, I'm better off calling the shots for my life. But I want to push back on that gently because I would like to argue that from the beginning of humanity, we've always struggled with this concept. Um, it has nothing to do with your experience or the way you were raised or nurture. Um, I'm not a parent. Um, I am the youngest of six kids, and so I have a lot of nieces and nephews. I have 13 of them. I genuinely can't even remember most of the names. But if you ever need convincing that you and I are born with an innate desire to challenge authority, watch a two-year-old. <laughs> Two-year-olds can be the most wicked little things you've ever witnessed in your entire life. And I'm convinced this is why God actually makes kids cute, because I don't think any of us would pass being a, a toddler. But no one teaches a two-year-old to lose your mind when you don't get your way. Mommy and daddy didn't show the two-year-old, like when, you, when, when it doesn't go your way, I want you to throw yourself on the ground and just lose it. That's not nurture. That's nature. And we know this truth. We see it all around us. We like to hide it. We like to think, no, 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 I'm actually not that off in my heart. But why? Why are we the way we are? Why do we challenge this? Why do we want to make our own decisions? Why do we not like being told what to do outside of us being American? <laughs> I think Genesis 3 actually has that answer for all of us. And I think, it, I think it accurately dissects each and every one of our hearts. And so as we heard uh, through the reading, it says that God put man and woman in the garden. And then he gave them one rule. You ever think about that? One rule, that's it. It wasn't the Ten Commandments. It wasn't a list of ethics. It started with one thing. It says in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil 
you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Simple. One rule. And by the way, the best understanding of the knowledge of good and evil, this is not to become aware that there is good and bad. It's becoming the arbiter, the one who gets to decide this is what's right and this is what's wrong. And then in Genesis 3, it says, the serpent said, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The, the first hand, no, he did not say that actually at all. He, he actually said almost the very opposite. It's a, did he actually say you can't? No. And, and this is actually the first tactic of the enemy of your souls. He's going to make it sound like obeying God is it's too restrictive. It limits all options. But Eve replies and says, no, 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 we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Firstly, according to scripture, it never says you couldn't touch it. And I'm not trying to read into this too much, but I do think we do this all the time. Like, if we're honest, we, we actually like to add more to than what Scripture actually says about things. And we get legalistic on things. And we do this especially when it comes to sexuality. I'm guilty of it myself. We love to say more than what Scripture says. But she also says a very odd phrase. She says, the tree in the midst of the garden. In Genesis 2.9, it says, in the midst of the garden are two trees. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. My question is, why doesn't she refer specifically to the tree of the knowledge and evil? Why does she say the tree in the midst when there are actually two? This is just my speculation, but it almost seems as if Eve is overgeneralizing God's commandment in order to make it appear unfairly restrictive. Meanwhile, God has given them everything else. Everything else is theirs, including the tree of life, which actually offers eternal life, and she never mentions it. In fact, she almost seems to imply that the only tree in the midst, the, only, the most important thing in this whole thing is the one we can't even eat from. I wonder how far away these two trees were from, from each other. I wonder how many times they walked past this tree of life. We can be so fixated on what we want that we miss the goodness that's offered to us every single day. C.S. Lewis actually said it best in his, if you've read, ever read his space trilogy, um, in the Paralandra, there's this, when he's referring to the Eve character, there's this, this point where he says, you can send your soul after the good you had expected or what you wanted instead of turning to the good that you had got. You could actually refuse the real good and you could make the real fr fruit taste insipid by thinking of the other. We so desire the thing we're not allowed or that we don't have and we lose sight of the truly better thing that's actually offered in front of us all the time. We actually poison the thing in front of us with our selfish desires. And it says, then the serpent wins the rest of humanity and Eve over with a single lie in Genesis 3, 4. It says, no, 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 you won't surely die. No, actually, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes are going to be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And what I actually find so fascinating is, if you notice, the enemy of your soul, he doesn't even challenge the idea that God exists. He doesn't go after that. He's actually much too sly for that for most of the time, especially if you grow up in the church. Like, that's probably not what you're challenged with. He just goes right after, but can you trust him? I mean, is he actually that good? Because it kind of seems wicked. He kind of seems like, why would he actually do this? Like, why would he even give you that option? It seems like he's got this thing behind his back, and he's saying, but not for you. And he falls for it uh, in the same way that you and I fall for it every single day. Um, but here's where I think it gets really fascinating and why I think it really applies to us when, when it comes to intimacy with God and, and even our own sexualities and bodies. It says before Eve ate, she saw three things about this tree. 
It was good for food. It was a delight to the eyes. And it was desired to make one wise. Three things. And this past summer, I was actually talking to a group of Christian teenagers in Boston. Um, I was doing a series of lectures, and I kind of got a group of them to sit down with me, and I said, look, I I want you to just talk to me about what do you think God should believe about sexuality? Like, what do, you, what do you think his rules should be? If you were God, what, like, you've designed this whole thing. What should God really believe about sexuality? And here's what they said. You know, we're told as Christians that you have to wait until you're married to have sex and that marriage has to be a man and a woman. But, if it doesn't hurt anyone, I like it, and it feels innate, it feels natural to me, then it shouldn't be sinful and God should accept it. Three things. If it doesn't hurt, so it's good. I like and enjoy it, so it's a delight. And it's natural, it's outside of my control, so it's a desire. It's the same three things. It's the same three, same three things Eve faced, it's just packaged a little differently. And what's the core lie? You can't trust God. He doesn't really care about sexuality that much. He he really just wants you to be happy. That's actually why he created you. And if we're honest, this is how we justify every single sin when it comes to our sexualities. Surely, God would want me to be happy, and this makes me happy. But see, this, this example also shows us a very skewed definition of sin that if we're not careful we jump right into it's also it's actually the the narrative and it's the it's the cultural definition of of sin even the most secular person would actually agree with this definition of sin which is pretty much sin is first and foremost just doing bad things that hurt ourselves or others that's the core of sin doing bad things that hurt ourselves and others in fact i'd say the creed of the progressive gospel right now is god is most interested most interested in your happiness and enjoyment therefore do what makes you happy as long as it doesn't it doesn't hurt anyone it sounds compelling it actually sounds amazing to be honest you're like yeah just do what makes me happy just as long as i don't hurt anybody but what did we see from the original sin what was the actual core of the original was it about harm was it about doing the thing that makes me happy The core of the original sin is taking place, taking the place of God. It's, I get to say what's right and wrong for me. It's, I'm the arbiter of good and evil. I get to decide. No one tells me what to do, not even God, if we disagree. Now, can sin be hurting others? Absolutely. But it's only secondarily. And here's why. When you hurt someone, you're hurting someone who is made in the image of God, which, which is our primary identity. We learned that last week, right, in the series. So when you hurt that person, you're actually assaulting the very image that that person was created in, who is God himself. And that's where sin starts. It's assaulting God. Have you guys ever noticed, have you ever, ever got perplexed in, in Psalm 51 where David says, Against you and you alone have I sinned, O God. What is he talking about? How can he say those words? He literally forces a woman to sleep with him, impregnates her, and then has her husband killed. How can he dare say against you and you alone, oh God, have I, have I sinned? It looks like he's actually trying to get away from it, but he's, he's actually upping the ante. He's saying, when I do these things to someone who's created in your image, I do them to you. Sin is always vertical. God, I'm God, and you're not way before it's ever Horizontal, I did something bad or I hurt someone. The reason why we struggle so much with what the Bible has to say about sexuality is because we don't see sin as taking the place of God. We see sin as hurting ourselves and others. And so when we don't see harm, we don't see sin. But see, the heart of sin is not harm, it's pride. And we would never vocalize this, but every time we choose sin, what we're actually saying in our hearts is, I'm just a little bit smarter than God. (laughs) Like, if he knew my situation, he also would, it's just like, I know what's best for me, and he doesn't. 
The Bible is so overwhelmingly clear. I know it's, for deb- I know it's up in de- debate right now, but can I just tell you, it is so over- overwhelmingly clear what God's design for sex is and marriage is. From Genesis to Revelation, there is a clear, clear image, illustration, specifics, all of it. It all fits there, but it's a very hard truth today. It's really difficult to live by. It It seems so limiting, and it seems so restricting. It seems so unloving, because God's design is that sex would ultimately be for marriage between one man and one woman. That's it. That's his one specific template. But before we do what Eve did which is to overgeneralize and try to say things God doesn't say, I want us to look at what does that actually mean? What does that say for all of us? Regardless of our sexualities, regardless of our genders, what does that mean to every single one of us? Firstly, we need to admit that's a very high bar. All sexual activity, all sexual activity outside of the covenant marriage of a man and a woman is considered sin and outside of his design. Which one of us has done that? perfectly. So very clearly from the get-go, heterosexuals don't get a pass on sexual sin. But also within this understanding, does this mean that those who are LGBTQ plus are inherently more sinful or wicked? No. It actually doesn't say that. And moreover, does this mean that, that two men or two women cannot have a loving relationship that in many ways models the beauty of marriage? That's tricky. But the answer is no. In fact, I would argue that common grace would say it's very possible for two men or two women to, to even benefit from some of the blessings of marriage when they are sacrificially loving each other and committing themselves to one another. But here's the thing. Does that make it right? Does it make it in God's design, only if you completely undermine the point of marriage and you believe that sin is about harm and not trying to be God. Do you see how critical that point is? Because I'm telling you this right now, as somebody that travels and speaks, I know so many people who have lost their Christian faith, who have completely deconstructed it. How many teens right now do not believe the Christian faith or have believed a progressive version of the faith because what they say is this, you know, I believe the traditional understanding of sexuality for such a long time, but then one of my good friends was, is, is gay, and they got married, and I'm like, it, I don't see how that's bad. They're not hurting anyone. And in fact, they're, they seem to be loving, and, and actually, I thought this would be so wicked. And, and what that actually exposes is not that our theology was wrong. It actually exposes, and, and please hear me when I'm saying this, it actually exposes your, your, your bigoted heart. Because what it's saying is you thought that, that, that gay people were more inherently wicked than you. And that if they, the way they do things, that, that's actually, the, it's, it's actually, I can't believe that there would be love behind it. That actually just exposes your heart. It doesn't say anything about Christian theology that says, actually, you're missing the whole point. This has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with what is his design and will you honor him regardless. So, so what is God saying when it comes to sexuality? He's saying, I designed this very specifically and it's ultimately, here, and here's something we don't want to believe, ultimately it's not about you. Your marriage, your sexuality, it's not even about you. Never has been. It's actually all about him. And here's another crazy point that I just don't think we talk about. Your sexual desires, they're not even primarily sexual. You're like, what do you mean by that? Like, let's just take another desire of yours. Let's say hunger. When you really just are craving a cheeseburger, are you actually craving a cheese? Is that what you're, is that the the core of your desire? No. The core of your desire is that your body needs nutrition in order to operate. It just so happens to manifest itself in a way that's hunger, and you you crave the cheeseburger that you like. Your desires are, for, your sexual desires are not primarily a sex drive. It's a, it's, a des, it's a signpost in your heart and your soul for intimacy. And God's actually created you to have intimacy with him. And this is why the point of his good design is about his marriage, not yours. If I could sum up the entire Christian sexual ethic, it's that everything that we do should reflect and point to the marriage between him and his bride and has nothing to do with whether you and your bride. Like, it's about you reflecting that. And this is really good because even though he restricts and has restrictions on our sexual behavior, he says, I will not restrict myself from you. 
And that's the thing you and I want. And sometimes we go to sexuality, we even go to marriage, even godly marriage, thinking that that's the thing that will do it, and it never does. And we sometimes worship this thing that's actually supposed to be a good gift, a man and woman coming together, at a ref, and we worship that. Meanwhile, it was supposed to be the signpost to our intimacy with him. We were created for intimacy with God, and our sexualities actually point to that. But rather than going to the author of it all we follow and follow his design, we take things in our own hands. But he asks us the same questions he asks about everything. Will you trust me in this? Will you obey me even when you don't like it? Will you trust that being obedient to me, it's actually good for you? Or like Eve, are we going to say, no, I think you actually are withholding good. And did you ever notice that God never gives a reason why they can't eat from the tree? He gives a consequence, but he never actually says why. And I've thought about this for a while. It's like, man, it would have just been so much easier. Like, here's why. <laughs> but even in trying to figure out why he didn't, I, I found myself thinking, you know, that's so funny because if I know the reason why, I might do it simply because I agree or because I want to. And then again, that just puts me right back into the shot of being the person calling the shots. It still goes to the heart of sin, which is, I'm still playing God. I'm still saying what I want to do, and I get to decide what's better. See, the heart of Christianity is God asking us, will you obey me simply because you love me? In that initial story I shared with you all about touching that hot piece of metal, you know, where I lied, um, I thought I proved myself right in that situation. My dad told me not to do something. I didn't get hurt. I'm right. And to be honest, in some ways, I was right. He told me if I touched it, I would get hurt, and I didn't. But in reality, I had no idea that it was that mentality that would usher in all kinds of sin in my life. It was that mentality that would usher in all kinds of hurt and brokenness. Every sin I chose thereafter actually started with the mindset no one tells me what to do. I can trust myself. And just like Adam and Eve, sin has consequences. And look, sometimes we see them firsthand. Sometimes we don't. Adam and Eve probably thought to themselves, it's our lives. What we do won't affect others. Having no clue that their decisions brought sin into the world. And so when you and I choose sin, even in private matters like our sexuality, even when we think it's loving, it affects others and it affects ourselves. See, this is why in Matthew 5, Jesus says a very, very hard saying. He says, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with, his her, with her in his heart. Why is that wrong? Like, really? Why is a lustful thought wrong? Who's getting hurt? Is Christ just being so strict? Or is it actually because he loves us? Uh, author and speaker Sam Albury once put it this way. He says, you know, we, when we look at that passage, we see it in the negative. He's like, but if you reverse it, you see what God's trying to say. Because what he's actually saying in Matthew 5 is this. You are so, your sexuality is so important. You're, you as a person, your whole person is so valuable to God that it's not okay for someone to violate you even in the privacy of their mind. That's how much God loves you. That's why Christ says, no, no, no. Sin always starts in the heart. It's not okay for someone to violate you, even in the privacy of their mind, because the mind matters. I was introduced to pornography when I was about eight years old. And as a Christian, I did everything I could to hide this part of me because I knew I, I couldn't share it. And so for almost a decade... I poisoned myself thinking I was doing something that I liked. I didn't see the harm. And everybody around me told me it was natural. And can I be honest with you? 
I didn't actually see the problem with it for a long time. I didn't see the consequences. I actually wasn't sleeping around. I really tried to honor God with my sexuality. That This is just one area of that. It's like, you know, it's fine because it's, it, I never acted out. I didn't mistreat the girls in my life. I wasn't seeing them as objects. And then it got so twisted and so dark that I remember looking at these videos and I sat there and I started crying and I said, Lord, I don't know what I'm looking at. How did I get this far? I'm now engaged and I'm still I'm just now seeing the consequence. Christ is saying something to every single one of us in Matthew 5. He's saying something very universal. He's not just saying it to secular people. He's not just saying it to LGBTQ people. He's saying that all of us are sexually broken. None of us are doing it well. We all have a sinful heart, and we need a heart transformed by him. Paul says it perfectly in 1 Corinthians 6, 18. He says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Man, nothing stays with us longer, has more control over us quite like sexual sin and brokenness. And we know it. Even those of us that don't want to admit it, we know the sexual sin that is just wreaking havoc in our lives currently. In fact, if we could go around in this room and hear everybody's just sexual story, there wouldn't be a single dry eye in this room. But in his goodness, God desires to rescue us from ourselves. He desires to make us whole. We so desire to be known and loved, but we're so afraid to be fully known. Gosh, that's scary. Because, and and it's a, the fear is rational because what will people do if they know my deepest, darkest brokenness? Will anyone actually love me if they know the things I've done or the things I think or the things that have been done to me? This is one of my biggest fears in confessing my sins about pornography. This is why it took me so long to just come out and tell the world where this is what I was struggling with. I was hiding in shame and fear. And I know I didn't have time to get into this part of scripture, but as we finish, do you guys remember what Adam and Eve's first response to their sin was? It was hiding. It was shame. But what I love about Christianity, what I love about the God, the real God of the Bible, is that his first response to them is to come near. It's to clothe them. It's actually to love them in spite of their brokenness. When we sin, God's first response is grace. And often, I don't feel like that's what we hear when it comes to sexual sin. It's the one area we're not allowed to fail. Can I say as a Christian male, it's the one area I think I'm not allowed to fail. It's the one area that disqualifies me to do anything. And that doesn't mean that there's no, I mean, the fact that God forgives us and he's willing to forgive, that doesn't mean there's con, there isn't no consequence. In fact, there's, there's absolutely consequences, and often the consequences are great. But if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense that sexual sin would wreak the most havoc because if the point of our sexuality is ultimately about reflecting one of the most beautiful truths that we will ever know, which is his desire to be wed to us. At the end of time, that's the point. If it can swing that far into that beauty, how much further can it swing the other way as well? This is why sexuality is different. This is why it feels different to us. This is why it's the, it's the type of sin where it feels like we do carry it for years. I'm very aware, because I know the heart of man, I know the heart of myself, that some of you are still hiding. And it's out of fear because you want to be known, but you're so ashamed because even though you're in church, even though you call yourself a Christian, you feel like you're utterly failing. And your sin is growing and it's starting to ruin your life because it will eventually do that. 
I don't say this as a fear tactic, but I say this as sin will destroy your life. And this is why God so will lovingly is trying to get us out. Can I just encourage you, confess your sins. Can I encourage this church to be a place where you can be broken but accepted? See, the heart of your pastors in this church is that this would be a place where you could be known authentically. You could be your authentic self. There's no facades. You don't have to put up walls. You don't have to pretend that you have it together. And this is why this series is happening. This is how much they love you. They want you to know this is the place that you can actually confess sin and you're not going to get the door slammed on you. But see, it's not just about confessing our sins to God and repenting. James 5, 16, I think it's one of the most powerful verses in the New Testament. It says, confess your sins to one another, pray for one another, and you will be healed. Confession is one of the scariest things we can do, but it's far better than hiding. Gosh, confession sheds light on sin, and sin thrives in darkness. When you confess your sins, sin starts to lose its power over you. Confessing my sin of pornography was one of the hardest and scariest things I ever did. Because I had to be exposed for the, the fraud I was. The one claiming to live this Christian life and honoring God with my sexuality, but secretly having this sin. But man, it started a journey of healing. And oh, the relief. <laughs> I talk about pornography more than this because I just want people to know the freedom to not have a secret sin, to walk in light because man, it is such a different feeling. The joy it is to know that I'm walking in transparency and light and that God has actually slowly healed my heart and again, does that mean there's, did it eliminate the consequences? No, I'm still dealing with it, and I'm probably going to have to deal with it uh, for a long time. But I am forgiven, and he's healing me day by day. So those of you that resonate with my story, I just want you to remember God's response to Adam and Eve. He clothes them in animal skins. He, God sheds blood to cover them so that they were no longer naked and ashamed. But as we know, those skins were only temporary. And eventually, God, as we know in the life of Christ, sheds his own blood so that you and I can be clothed, not in animal skins, but his righteousness. You can actually have right standing with God now in light of your sin. No more hiding, no more shame to be fully known and fully loved. The serpent put a lie into every single one of our hearts through a tree. But Jesus came to take that lie out of our hearts, and he also did it through a tree, the cross. It's through the cross that God has shown that the motivation of his commandments about sexuality is his love for you, not to be rigid. A God that is willing to forgive you, take the penalty of your sin, and love you unconditionally, I promise you, is a God you can trust with your sexuality, even if it's difficult. If you remember anything from this morning, as I wrap this up, I just want you to remember God is not withholding anything good from you. Don't believe the first lie and the lie that starts every other sin. God is not withholding anything good from you. He loves you. And he wants you to flourish and be satisfied in him. But Christianity is all about believing that he is the greatest good. That following him is our greatest delight. And that he satisfies the desires of your heart. Before I pray, I just want to maybe offer one maybe question. I know you guys do the, what is it? For, it's not a talk, a turn and talk. I know, obviously we're talking about sexuality. This would be a very fun talk. We'd be like, hey, you want to talk about what we just talked about? Um, one thing I would love to just maybe challenge with you. Oh, and I have one minute. Good, this is perfect. Um, You know the sin I'm talking about because when I brought it up, your, pro your heart probably started pounding. And I don't say that because I'm a guru or like whatever, a spiritual. I know it because I know it. I feel that. And can I just challenge you? <laughs> I've just walked through one of the worst seasons of my life because of the sexual brokenness of an individual. And it ruined things. It's not too late. Confess now. 
Even when you think it's too late, even if you think, man, I'm telling you, it is always better to confess, even when there's consequences. Even when it fractures relationships, it is always better to confess. And I just want you to just maybe sit and pray and ask, Lord, what is that thing? And find people in your life that you can actually be real with. Because I'm telling you, there is freedom. God desires for you to live in freedom because of what he's done on the cross. And whatever this world will do to you or say about you in life, it doesn't matter because he's forgiven you. And he has redeemed you. Amen. Let me just pray. Father, I thank you so much for this congregation. I thank you for um, what a privilege it is to come to a place where they, they don't know me. Um, and I bring hard truths that I pray are actually your truths. Father, whatever was of you, please, would you water that? Would you grow it? And whatever was of me, I hope it falls on deaf ear entirely. Whatever was just me, I hope it is forgotten within minutes. But Lord, we know that you love us. Would you help us walk in freedom? Would you help us have the boldness to know that you love us and therefore we can confess our sins in boldness knowing that you have accepted us and that Christ has paid for everything on the cross. We say this in your son's name. Amen. Thanks, Lou. Um, so I'm going to invite you to remain seated. And I was going to say, let's do a turn and talk, but I think maybe let's just sit and close your eyes and in your heart talk with your father and consider that thing that, that Lou just shared with us. Um, hearing what he shared, not only with your ears, but with your heart and, and taking that to God. Thank you, Father, for your, your truth. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, God, for clothing us the way that you have. For coming down and walking with us and choosing to love. you stand with us.
it from the mountain Go on and tell it to the mass That He is God Shout it Go on and scream
thank you for the words that you spoke through Lou's message today. Uh, we thank you that he had the courage to share the things that he shared. I know, Father, for myself, I have confessions very similar, and I expect that many people in this room do as well. God, we thank you that, that we can come to you, and we can share those hard things, and that we can know that you don't ostracize us, you don't push us away. But instead, God, you come near. You come near. So we thank you for that. God, I want to, uh, I just want to pray for one of our local partners, the Seat of Hope Center. That is a ministry, God, in this, in, in our location that is reaching out to women in particular. And they're providing not just, not just a service, they're providing an ability for, for, women to come to have to have healing to heal brokenness there might be addictions there there are these deep places Lord that need to be freed and the seed of hope center is there to walk through and to help direct and to help bring that about I pray father for for boldness for the staff to speak truth and love not to push away God but to speak truth and love and to speak your truth in love and to be able to extend that invitation that you so desire for these these beautiful image bearers of yours to come closer to you and to know you we pray god that you would bring advocates that you would bring nurses that you would bring mentors that you would bring committee members and board members people who can pour into this organization and make it thrive even more so than it has in the past Father, we thank you for the seed of hope. We thank you for the work that they're doing. We pray that you would continue working through them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Please stand. Let's finish with one more song.
thirst for a drink from the well, Jesus is calling. Go come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide for and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling
Hi there, my name is Julie Slattery and I'm with the ministry Authentic Intimacy and our mission is reclaiming God's design for sexuality. And that's exactly what we hope to do on February 26th at Kettlebook Church in West Bend, Wisconsin when we have an all day rethinking sexuality conference. So the idea of this conference is to really give Christians an understanding of why God cares about your sexuality. We're gonna spend all day looking at, first of all, what does it mean to believe God's design for sexuality? What does that actually look like? How should we be thinking about our sexuality? Then we'll do a section on what does this actually mean for my life? How do I walk as a believer in Jesus Christ with sexual integrity? And then our third session will be more missions focused. How do we interact with the world who doesn't really agree with God's view of sexual issues? What does it look like to walk with grace and truth? And then the fourth session, which is the final session, is really practical as I take your questions live as to how we apply this in everyday life. So I really hope that you'll join me. And um, we're looking forward to having a great group of people there, just really seeking God's desire for how we walk out biblical sexuality. You can register at kettlebook.org slash events. I hope to see you there on February 26th. So uh, very excited to see Julie. She's going to be here in two weeks. I'm going to have a chance to interview her on Sunday morning uh, here, and we're going to interview her in Jackson as well. But the day before that, Saturday, she's got that full-day conference. And really looking forward to it. I would encourage you to, to sign up and, and spend the day with us as we process through these very important topics. Also, if you enjoyed what you heard from Lou and want to process more, what we asked Lou to do is to come back at 12.15 here in this space, and there's going to be a live Q&A. We don't have lunch because we didn't want to necessarily have you have to sign up ahead of time, um, but we do have some light snacks. So Lou's going to be back here at 12.15. would encourage you to, to come back, and we'll have live Q&A. If you have questions that you'd like to submit anonymously, we'll have an option for that. I think we have a slide for that as well. Um, Aaron, somewhere in there, there's a QR code. If you want to submit some questions that way that we'll address maybe either today at 12.15 or else throughout the series, but would really encourage you to engage in these opportunities for us to have ongoing conversation about this. If, uh, if you want to have some, someone pray for you, we'd love to pray for you after the gathering. Uh, we'll be up here in the front. We'd love to process through anything or pray with you. Uh, having said that, I just want to ask you to stand as um, I pray a benediction over you. And one of, I have a whole page of notes from what Lou shared, but something that really just struck me was that was these words. Um, Kettlebrook family, can we know that God's first response to our sin is to come near and cover us? May we know the grace that abounds in Jesus Christ. May we know that though we have been deceived by one tree, we have been made redeemed through the other one, through the cross. May we live in light of that good news, and may we help to share that good news with others. In the midst of our sin, in the midst of our brokenness, may Christ be exalted. We pray this in Christ's name and all God's people said, amen. I invite you to come back again next weekend. We'll be in chapter three, which is redemption. Thanks for joining us this morning and worshiping with us virtually. We'd love for you to take a next step. Uh, maybe that's joining a group. Maybe that is serving in some way, but some way in a family of faith near you, taking a step beyond the virtual gathering. Yeah, what we read in Scripture is that the body is meant to build one another up into the fullness and maturity of Christ. And that cannot happen really alone. We don't find uh, lone wolf Christians, if you would, in the New Testament. And so we would so strongly encourage you to engage in your local faith community where you are or here in the body at Kettlebrook Church. We'd love to.